Welcome one, welcome all. I am Bridger, and today we're doing a quick little review of a tabletop board game called Struggle of Empires. Now, this is an area majority, negotiation heavy, action selection game. And if that means nothing to you, don't worry about it. I'm going to do a quick overview of how the game actually plays and the kinds of decisions that you make before I talk a little bit more about my feelings on the game. What you're looking at right here is actually the vassal implementation of the game. Uh, what you, uh, you may have heard of this game, 2004 is when the original came out, but however, uh, last year, 2019, there was a Kickstarter put out by uh, Eagle, Eagle Griffin Games to create a deluxified version of it. And since I had never played the original, but I'd heard good things about it, and it's by legendary designer Martin Wallace, I decided to back that Kickstarter. And this summer, the deluxe edition arrived, and it's beautiful, and it's great, and I wanted to play it, but I couldn't play it because of the pandemic. So I went and created a Vassal module for it. If you want to figure out how to Get Vassal, you can go to Vassal.org, I'll put links in the description. It's a wargaming engine similar to Tabletop Simulator, except it's two-dimensional only, uh, but it has a lot of advantages over Tabletop Simulator and some disadvantages. You'll see if you want to get into it. Now, legendary designer Martin Wallace, if you don't recognize that name, you probably should, because he has 11 of his games in the top 500 on BoardGameGeek. That's out of, like, what, 30,000 games now? He's got 11 in the top 500, uh, and 128 total games listed. I feel like he's got to be... Number somewhere in the top five in terms of the most prolific designers out there next to, like, Reiner Kinesia. Games you might have heard of by Martin Wallace, Brass, which is both number three and number 19. Uh, Age of Steam, Steam, and Railways of the World are his uh, more uh, commonly popular train games. And A Few Acres of Snow is a war game that is highly regarded by Martin Wallace. So this sits somewhere in the middle of a Euro game and a war game. There's definitely a lot of conflict. There's a lot of player interaction. There's heavy negotiation. Uh, but it's got a lot of more Euro-like mechanics. It's You're not like... Uh, pushing counters around a map and drawing supply lines, you're you're taking an action to move some guys uh, over an arbitrary long distance where there's no real movement restrictions, and then declaring a battle. So the interesting decisions come in where you're going and what you're fighting over and how you can convince people to help you. So let's talk about the game. Before we get there, I do warn, the game is three to four hours minimum, and it might be five if uh, if you're all new players, it might take a little longer than that. But it's not going to stretch that much longer than five hours, in my opinion. But it's a good, like, it's an afternoon game. Not a weeknight game, like a get-together on Saturday game. Also, it really does require five to seven players to get the most out of this. I've played a four-player game and a five-player game, and I by far enjoyed the five-player game more. The mechanics just sing a lot better when you've gotten more people involved. It does technically come with rules for playing with two and three players. I don't know that I would ever personally want to play it that way. In fact, if somebody suggests, if we've got four people and somebody suggests this, I'm probably going to suggest something else. But if we got five, six, or seven, then I'll probably be interested in playing this. So let's talk about what we're looking at here. What you see is uh, the map in this main area of the board here. And on the left-hand side, this is my attempt. I created this Vassal module, and this is my attempt to recreate the other pieces in the game. So what you're seeing on the left is not part of the actual game interface if you had the physical game on the table. It's just representing the amount of coins you have, the amount of population you have, and the amount of victory points that you have. Normally, those would be little tokens in front of you. And then, of course, you've got these holding areas for the armies, the navies, and the forts. And then at the bottom is basically the players' tableau areas, the area where if they have any tiles that they've claimed on the board, they would be down here in this area to show, okay, the blue player has the blockade tile, and the, I don't know, the red player has the militia tile, a militia tile, if I can click it correctly, like that. So this is, again, just representing, these are the seats at the table where people would have the things in front of them. Since there's no hand of cards, we didn't need a separate window for the tableau, it's not secret information, so it's just put here on the main map. Okay, that all having been explained, let's talk about the way that the game flows. 
The game flows over three rounds, which are called wars. And you can see in the top right here, there's a little uh, pawn in the physical game that tracks which war you're in, one, two, or three. Each war, you go through six phases, which are nicely detailed on the top of the board here. Phase one, phase two, phase three. is Phase three is the heart of the game. Phase four is some uh, monetary upkeep where you have to pay for your soldiers and you get some income. And then five, you check victory points. Six is a cleanup phase, and then you go back to one and two. Uh, and... You do that three times, and at the end of phase three on the third war, you find out who has the most victory points, and that's the winner. But before we can talk about victory points, we got to talk about neutral region markers. These are the heart of the game system. These are what you're fighting over. So there are 65 of these tiles in the physical game, and you put them inside a physical bag and draw them randomly for various... Uh, pieces of the setup and during the game itself to add some variety to things that the players can fight over each war. So 65 are all in the bag essentially at the beginning and each of them has a location. This one is the Caribbean and then it has a type. This is a uh, colonize action because it costs you one population to use it so they have a minus population as the colony symbol. This one is also in the Caribbean but it is uh, a uh, they politely termed Gold Coast Commerce Action, <clears throat> slavery, uh, that they tried to clean up a little bit here uh, in, in order to use to take this tile. And then other tiles would have a number representing the amount of force required to conquer that tile and gain it as your own. In every case, when you take the action required to claim these tiles, you then get to replace the tile with your control marker, and that would then mean that you control that tile, and the person with the most controlled tiles in each area gets the first place victory points, and then the second per second per second most gets the second place victory points, etc. So we're going to put these back here and take a look at the map, because you can see I've got holding boxes for everything here. And I can actually distribute a whole bunch of them onto the board so you can see uh, them in better, brighter colors. Um, in the physical game, they would, they would stay in the bag, and there aren't any holding boxes. You would just place them onto the map when they are available, because not, not all of them are available all the time. So you can see there's, for example, six of them in North America, seven in the Caribbean, six in South America, etc., and the total is 65. There are 11 different scoring areas, uh, including the one, two, three, four, five, six colony areas, these ones in the circles, plus the German states, the Mediterranean, the Ottoman Empire, Central Europe, and the Baltic states. The other areas, Britain, France, Spain, United Provinces, Prussia, Austria, and Russia are actually the player powers. You can't ever fight over those home areas. You can't even move forces into opposing enemy home areas. That's just not part of the game. You're fighting over these victory point areas. And for example, the German states is the most prosperous victory point area. The person who has the most of these markers under their control gets eight victory points, the person who has the second most gets five, and the third most gets three. And then one of the least valuable is Africa, where first place gets three and second place gets two. And you say least valuable, but the game is won and lost by three or four victory points, so that can mean the difference between winning and losing. In our games, the winners typically had between uh, 50 and 62 victory points, that's like the top three places is somewhere in that range. And the winner sometimes only won by two or three points. So, you know, Africa can be important, especially because if you use a very small number of actions to get those three points and keep them over the course of all three wars, nobody challenges you for them because they're like, eh, it's only three points. Then you've got nine points instead, right? These are scored three times. So that's how these markers uh, uh, function. Uh, there's the three different ways to get them. You either have to conquer them if they have a strength point value, you colonize them, it costs you a population, or you use Gold Coast Commerce, which only costs you an action as long as you have an, uh, a navy present in Africa. Very dark, uh, that particular action, but uh, we're going to pass over that. Let's talk about how the game sets up, because that's one of the really fun things about the game, is it's very different every time, right? So the actual setup is essentially works like this. You pick a random start player. In this case, uh, it looks like Austria has been chosen. Uh, then you uh, go ahead and distribute the neutral region markers on the map based on the number of players. I'm, I've got a seven player game set up here. So you distribute 10 neutral region markers to the map. These are the only things that players can fight over that are neutral 
in the first war. In the second war, we'll add 10 more. And in the third war, we'll add 10 more. That's actually what the first phase is over here on the left, is you add 10 new things to fight over, and that drastically changes the game. If, for example, in this game, there's nothing to fight over in the Mediterranean yet, um, and uh, we actually had a game where the German states didn't have any markers pulled, until the Third War, which was very unlikely, uh, but we did have some, uh, it was a four-player game, so there was a bunch of tokens taken out to balance things, so it wasn't completely uh, mathematically unusual, uh, but it was still made for a very interesting game, because as soon as the Third War, everybody piled in to try to get those German states' big victory points, and before that, we were fighting over places that are normally not fought over, because they aren't worth as much, or at least not fought hard for. Uh, so that's how you get a sort of random setup, a different setup each time for these neutral markers. Then the players each get to pull five markers out and put their control marker where each of those five go. Now, I have it set to a single button here that's doing it for all seven players, which is why it's taking 20, 25 seconds, but you'll see in a second it will pop into existence. There we go. So everybody starts out with some control markers spread out over the map. There's also some rules for if you get two in an area, you can put one back and redraw. We're going to ignore that for now. Uh, and so this seeds the board with a very different way the game plays each time. For experienced players, instead of drawing randomly, each player could draft, uh, you know, you pull six markers, you pick one, and then you set, pass the other five to the left, and then you draw again, you pick one, you pass to the left, you draw again, until everybody's got five. So that's another way to play, and the rulebook has that option for experienced players. Oops, I disconnected that. So this creates a very interesting setup where sometimes you start with a bunch of markers in, I don't know, the East Indies and India and South America, which might make Portugal a much more attractive option to you as an alliance because they help in those areas. Another time you might be heavily invested in Central Europe and the German states, which cannot have any navies fight there because they're inland. And so you don't build that much of a navy. You don't care about naval training. So it really changes the decisions you make each game. It's not static, it's not rote, you don't have a developing meta where, oh, you always get this first or always get that second. That's one of the things I really like about it. Lots of replayability there. And the last thing that happens during setup is each player chooses one military unit to place out on the board, and you do that five times around the table. So all players have five military units out on the board. I've gone ahead and done it for us here. So you can see kind of what the board looks like at setup. So let's walk through the phases very quickly. I'm not gonna go into super detail here. I just want you to give you an idea, if you haven't played it before, what it's like, so that my thoughts make sense in context. So the first thing that happens is you would place more new neutral region markers on the map. But you don't do that, you skip that phase on, on the first war because you've already done it during the setup before the players put their units out so they can see what they're playing on. Uh, and then you go to phase two. This is, in a lot of respects, uh, the big important thing that makes this game different from a lot of other games. Remember how I said this is a very heavy negotiation game? This is where it starts. You have the alliance auction. Every war, there are gonna be two grand alliances. One is gonna have four powers, the other is going to have three. And which alliances are on which, I'm sorry, which powers are on which alliance is up for bidding. So, for example, in this game, Austria was the player that started the game with the gavel, randomly chosen. So they get to propose the first bid. And they might say, maybe they want to go first so they can get the tile of their choice before anybody else does. It's hard to see here, and I'll zoom in real quick so you can get a better idea of what this looks like. But this spot represents first in the turn order, then second, then third, then fourth, then fifth, then sixth, and then whoever winds up in this slot is seventh. So. For example, you're not only bidding on which alliance you're going to be in, but which turn order you're going to be in. And early in the game, being early in the turn order is valuable. Later in the game, towards the second and third war, you want to be later in the turn order because you can make one last attack for victory points that people can't respond to. So if somebody wants to go last, you make them pay for it in the auction to balance things out. So Austria says, I wanna go first. So they put themselves here and they have to put somebody else. And you know what, they're looking at the board and they say, you know, I want to go after those, um, let's see, who's Austria sharing the board with? They wanna be able to go after um, yellow down here in India, just for the sake of argument. So they want to put yellow opposite them, 
which means that they will be allowed to actually fight yellow. And they bid one for this. Everybody starts with 10 gold, by the way. This should be at 10. And then, uh, later on, uh, it goes around the table, and Prussia says, I'm okay with that. I don't really care. And they pass. And Russia says, I pass. And Netherlands says, no, 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 no. I don't want yellow to be there. I want to go to war with you, and I want to be second. And they up the bid to two. So when you up the bid, you can up it any money, the amount they want. They could up it to five or ten or whatever, but if they win, that's how much gold they have to pay. Right? So, uh, you know, it goes around the table and eventually gets back to Austria. And Austria says, no, 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 I really want to do yellow and I'm willing to bid four for it. And it goes around the table and everybody else passes. Well, at that point, they, they white wins the bid, Austria wins the bid, and they must then pay four gold. So you see I've got a button here that automates it. I actually did it for blue because I'm signed in as the blue player. But uh, you get the idea. These slide down. Now Prussia is up and they get to propose a bid. So Prussia maybe wants to go last. They put green and orange here because they don't really care. And they bid zero. And then somebody else says, uh, no, 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 no. I want uh, blue to be there. And I'm willing to bid one for that, et cetera, et cetera. It goes around again. And these slide down once everybody passes. And the player who won the bid has to pay the gold. And here's where things get interesting. I'm just going to randomly add these up here. You want specific people to be on the other alliance, right? Because that way you can attack them. That's the key. If they're on your alliance, you cannot directly attack them during the war phase. So if you look at the map and go, okay, look, uh, you know, so-and-so blue is really vulnerable here in Africa, and orange has set himself up to attack blue and take control of that very easily, but blue paid a little more to make sure orange is on their team, so now orange can only attack the, the, the dark gray player, Austria, uh, Prussia. So that machinations and how much is it worth to you is very important. And here's the, here's the delicious part. This is where it gets so great for me. Gold is tricky to come by and it, and it pays for a lot of things, not just this auction, but you have an infinite amount of gold. Because if you ever go into the negative, if you ever don't have enough gold to pay for a thing that you just won at the auction, you can tax your people to get more gold. Every time you tax, you get two gold and one unrest token. And in this case, Austria went down to negative three, so they had to tax twice, and so they get two unrest tokens. These unrest tokens come in ones, twos, or zeros, and it's an average of one. So it's most likely to be a one. Sometimes it's a two, sometimes it's a zero, averages out to one. And the conflict the desire to spend more gold for all these great goodies that can help you get victory points is has to be weighted constantly against your unrest because at the end of the game if you have uh, 20 unrest then you wind up with zero victory points you lose the game because the french revolution happened in your country instead maybe maybe you are france in which case the french revolution happens in france uh but you know off off with their head marie antoinette let the meat take cake break out the guillotines could happen in russia if russia is the player that has more than 20 20 or more victory uh, uh, unrest points and it could happen to more than one player so having 20 or more unrest literally knocks you out of the game at the end you can't win but if you have the most unrest but are not at 20, you still get minus 7 victory points at the end of the game. That can easily be the difference between winning and losing. In fact, it was the difference between winning and losing in, my, in our last game. The person who came in first place was ahead of the second place player by about 4 points, but they also had the most unrest. I think they had 16 or 17 unrest. And so they lost 7 points. And the second place player, who uh, was not you know, in, in, in trouble for unrest, got to win the game. That balance is very tricky. And second place, uh, uh, most unrest gets minus four. So there are three different possibilities with regards to the unrest. But uh, that balance between, oh, I mean, I really want to force Orange to be on my side so they can't attack me. How much am I willing to spend on it? It's only the first war. If I get a lot of unrest now, that's a problem. Those kinds of decisions are really, 
really fun to mull over in this game. And they happen all the time, and the variables are always changing. In War Number 2, the board could look very different from now, especially because we're going to have some more neutral markers to, markers to fight over, and maybe you were mortal enemies with the white player in turn 1. Now, because of the way that you lost that war and you're no longer sharing the same areas, you make natural allies in War Number 2 to go after the leader and who's controlling the German states, for example, something to that effect. So I love this auction. I love the way that the money is infinite, but if you want more, it costs you unrest and you really don't want unrest. That tension is fantastic and trying to balance it is a really fun part of the game. Uh, so that's the Alliance auction, phase two. Phase three is where the meat of the game happens. You have five action rounds with each player taking two actions during those action rounds. Uh, there's a sixth action round if you're playing with two, three, or four players, but normally you don't play with that sixth action round. Now, this is where you actually can do all kinds of things, and to explain this very briefly, we can look at this. Uh, each round you can perform two regular actions or a regular action and a special action, denoted here by red being the special action color. So all of these things with the white carrots, these are all regular actions, and this is a regular action, and all the ones over here are special actions. Special actions, boy do you want to do special actions more than once a turn, because they are great, but you can't, because the game said no. You can also perform any number of free actions on your turn, taxing is always free, like I said, money's infinite, you can always do it, uh, and free action tiles um, uh, also give you the ability to use those as a free action during your turn, and tactics tiles, these red ones, can be used on your turn as well. Now, the base thing that you do in the game is building units and then moving units. Building units is simple. You build a unit in your home country, it costs you one population, you start with five, and then you deploy it somewhere. If you deploy it anywhere in Europe, it's a free move, it's automatic, and it just happens. Then your build is done. If you deploy it to one of the colonial areas, anything that has one of these circles with the, with the little striped line, then you have to roll the distant sea move dice. Anytime you cross this line, either from Europe or to Europe, you have to roll this. It's got a 40, uh, 4 out of 6, a 66% chance of check mark, no problems, you make it. And it's got a 1 out of 6 chance of a minor failure. You either have to go back where you came from or you have to pay a coin in order to make it there safely. And it's got a very small chance, also a 1 of 6 chance of a major failure, which is your unit is lost or pay 2 just to send it back where it came from or pay 3 to get it to where you want it to go. And that sounds like an easy thing and most of the time you're like, yeah, I'll just pay the coins. But later in the game you're looking at, oh man, their pile of unrest, which is secret by the way, you can't know for sure whether they have a lot of zeros, a lot of ones, or a lot of twos. But you're looking at their pile, man, their pile's just a little bit bigger than mine. If I just suck it up and like don't pay the gold now, maybe I'll have enough enough points to sneak under them and win the game, this choice can actually be interesting. So that's build. You just pay one population, you build a unit, and you send it where you want it to go. And building naval units, naval units can go to all the victory point areas except Central Europe and the German states do not have any naval uh, forces at all. You can see there is a ship marker right here in the Baltic states, there's a ship marker in the Mediterranean that's double colored, ships in the Mediterranean uh, fight in the Mediterranean and in the Ottoman Empire, uh, and then ship markers in all the colonial areas as well, denoting that you can have those ships there. So, uh, naval units, forts, by the way, are also uh, land units, and they can't move once placed, and they provide plus two in combat instead of one and only on defense. And you only get two of them. You get 14 uh, 14 land armies, you get, I think, eight naval units, and then you've got two forts. Um, the forts, because they can't move, where you put them is a very difficult decision, uh, at the, whenever you put them out. So everything costs one population, and that's it. That's your build. Move is pretty much, I just explained it. You can move two units. Boom, boom, that's the action. Uh, if you move it to uh, through one of these things, then you roll the distance move die for each unit to see if it makes it there or it costs you some money to get there. All right, so those are the simple actions, right? Build and move. And then attack is the other one that's a very common action, uh, and that always costs you two gold. Attacks are how you take control of most control markers, which means that's how you get most victory points, but it costs you two gold to do so. So not only do you need the gold here, you need the gold for every attack that you make. And every attack 
um, will have a, uh, potentially have a naval component and a land component. And every attack also includes a negotiation for whether your allies are going to help you or not. Maybe they're willing to do it because you're going up against the victor, the person who's in the clear lead and they want to see them knock down a peg. Or maybe they're willing to do it, but only if you're willing to pay some gold for it. And maybe they're not willing to do it at all because they see that you are going to make a big, big killing by taking advantage of uh, the German states here. Let's take, a, let's take a look at this example. Uh, right now, let's pretend that blue has moved their units into the German states on their first action, and they're going to declare an attack against uh, the white player on their turn, uh, as their second action, right? So they're going to do an attack. It costs two gold. So, oops, I am not the right player power here. Let's go back to blue. Blue declares an attack against white. And now we can look at the battle board. I made this up, by the way. This is not something that's present in the physical game. You normally just count the numbers and roll the dice. I just made it automated here. So you can see that the two blue armies are facing off against the one uh, Austrian uh, white fort. And it's two to two because forts are two on defense. Now the blue player has a fort there, but the forts can't take part in attacks. But the blue player can say, hey, Hey, I'm on an alliance with Yellow. Hey, Yellow, do you want to uh, do you want to help me out here against against the Austrians? If you help me out, I'll help you take out the the green guys and Austria and, and the and the the Yellow guys. Okay, I want one extra gold for this because you already committed to the attack, so you have to go through with this. If you want a good chance of winning, I'll help you. So they say fine. They'll give you your stinking gold. So then you see, okay, Spain says, sure, I'll commit to the attack. And then, you know, white can negotiate with their ally, green, and say, hey, do you want to help? And green says, no, 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 dog, don't drag me into this. I wouldn't do it for 100 gold for whatever reason. Who knows? And then uh, you would roll the army dice. And this is an interesting part of this game. The dice do not add to the strength. The difference in the two dice is what adds to the strength. So in this instance, because the defender rolled doubles, they get a zero. There's no difference between those dice. There's a five and a four. That's a difference of one. So the maximum that the dice can add for you is five. If you roll a one and a six, you can get a plus five on the dice. But if you just rolled a single die, then you are likely to get a one as you are to get a six for your bonuses. This makes it so that you're much more likely to get somewhere between a zero and a two on your dice. It's unlikely that it's less likely that you'll get a very big number. It's a nice little way of doing things and it keeps the numbers really small so that even a small advantage in numerical superiority here, for example, a four versus a two in strength points, that's going to be, I think, a uh, an 84 percent chance of victory for the person with the, the net of plus two. And if you had a plus three net, then it's an 89 percent chance of victory. Uh, so it's a very, you know, each plus one is very meaningful in this game. So if you can eke out, just get that. Oh, come on, ally, just send one more guy. Right. And here's the other thing about combat, which makes it, again, deliciously fun. You always have a chance to lose. Even if you win, you can still lose because if you roll a seven, if you roll that one six split or the two five split, you still have to take a loss. So in this case, the defender, the sorry, the person who loses the combat always takes a loss. So in this case, you can see the defender lost. So they suffered a loss, but the winner rolled a seven. So they still suffer attrition. And that, that is just great. It allows for so many different outcomes. And here's another seven that they rolled. Uh, and what I'm trying to find here is, yes, the defender can also suffer two losses. Or, sorry, the loser can suffer a second loss if they also rolled a seven as part of their combat roll. In this case, they don't have two things to lose. But here's the rub. If you are an ally in the combat, uh, it is possible for you to lose as well. But it has to be because your side lost the combat and because there was a seven rolled. So allies are normally pretty safe. The attacker and defender, the direct uh, conflict participants, have to take the first loss. But, you know, it, it makes it so that that's why Green maybe didn't want to get involved here. Because there's a high chance of them losing. And if they rolled a seven, then Green could lose a guy. Now, why is losing a guy bad? 
Well, losing a guy is bad for a number of reasons, uh, not least of which because now you have to build them back up again, and because that token was now, if for example you lose while defending, that token is now taken over by your opponent, right? But also, when you lose a unit, you always gain an unrest token. That is terrible. That's terrible. You never want to lose a token because you're already getting unrest every time you tax. Oh no. So combat is inherently risky. And that makes it fun. You've only got a plus one against me. That could backfire. You know, what if you go off against green? There you'll have a plus two against them. And I promise I won't even do this. Or you know what? If you don't attack, I will pay you three gold to go attack green instead of me. That those kinds of negotiations are really enjoyable because there's always some kind of risk to be had. And if you can provide enough gold, that can offset risks of future moves, which is very cool, right? So that's how the combat system works. There's a couple other cruxes to it that we're not going to go over just now, but that's your action for attack. And if it's a tie, the defender wins, but both sides take losses. Uh, is basically how that works. Another regular action you can take is to pass. This is one way to get rid of unrest. When you pass, as one of your actions, you get rid of one, one unrest. You could take, by the way, two of these in a row. You could do two attacks, you could do two builds, two moves, two passes, or you can do any combination of those there. Then the last regular action is a uh, Gold Coast Commerce or a Colonize action. Colonizing, it just costs you a population and boom, you get control of that thing, but now you would be fighting over it from now on. That thing can never be colonized again. It's only colonized the first time. Now players can attack each other to fight over it. Um, and a Gold Coast action can only be taken if you have a ship in Africa. So a colonize does not require anything except that you have enough population to support it. And uh, a Gold Coast commerce action just requires that you have a ship there, doesn't even cost population. So let's talk about population because it's an interesting mechanic. Population is used for two things. It's used for building your armies. I'm sorry, it's used for three things. Building your armies, each, each uh, military unit costs population, and it's used for this colonize action and it provides you with money when we get to phase four. You get income from your population. So if you spend all your population, turn all your population that you had for this war into military units, they don't provide you with any income. You've drafted people, they're not providing you with their basic taxes, right? So that's another thing. Do I build another guy? Because every military unit's gonna cost you one and every population is gonna give you one. So if you turn a population into a military unit, that's minus two to your income for, and that means your income could go negative, and that means you have to tax more, which means that you're gonna get more unrest. Wow, there, there's, there's cool stuff all through this game, right? Very good tension everywhere around. I can see why it's got so much good buzz. So uh, that is how you get control of those other things. And remember I mentioned the twos, you can just attack them, they defend at a two. Nobody can help uh, be an ally with the neutrals, by the way. If you attack a neutral, it just defends at a two. The green can't intervene and say, I'm gonna help the neutral. That's not how it works. You can only intervene in player versus player combat, which happens more and more because the neutrals get snapped up because they're usually slightly easier to attack. Okay, so that's the, uh, that's the regular actions. What about the special actions? Well, here's another twist. Say you don't want to spend your population point to build another military unit to help in future combats, but you know there's going to be a lot of fighting in the German states this war. Well, early on, you can seek help of a local alliance. And let's zoom in here a little bit so you can see them better. Again, this isn't the best board. I, I took a little photograph of my player board in order to get it in here because no scanner is big enough to get the board the way that I wanted it. But Bavaria and Saxony are two local alliances within Germany. Down here you can see Naples is a local alliance here, and the Ottoman Empire is a local alliance here as well. And there's another one, Cossacks, and then Sweden and Denmark. Now, local alliances come in two flavors. They are either land only, which is denoted by having just an army next to it, or they are land and navy because there's a land slash navy here, and I just made the markers look like that. So those local alliances provide a plus one bonus in combat, either to the land or to the land or navy. Land navy is an or, not an and. So you get to choose. This gives you uh, variability. You can choose whether you want that local alliance to help you in the naval combat or the land combat. And this one, 
you exclusively get land only, which makes sense in the German states, but Naples is land only and it can have a navy. So Naples is slightly less valuable than the Ottoman Empire, but the Ottoman Empire costs a gold. The Ottoman Empire, Denmark, and Portugal all cost a gold to establish those local alliances. All these other local alliances only cost the special action itself. So the local alliances, Here's the other thing with those. Yeah, they're a free plus one to whoever gets them first and they don't cost you a population and they're there for the whole thing and they can't be killed. But they go away at the end of the war. Next war, you have to build them up again if you want them there. They get cleared out. So that's local alliances. That's establishing a local alliances. That's one of your special actions that you can use. Um, sorry, that is could be your one special action. Claiming a tile is a special action. There are a ton of tiles that give you special abilities over here. There are also tiles spread around the board that you can't necessarily see. Here's sugar plantations right here. Here's uh, gold mines. Here's Gold Coast Commerce. Here's East India Company. All these ones on the board are called companies. And when you take these tiles, you can then use them as a free action to gain gold equal to the number of control markers you have in that area. So if you're, for example, uh, green, and you look at India and you played, planned to you know, take control of these over the course of uh, the first war, you can then pick up the East India Company and then use it as a free action towards the end of your turn after you've conquered four of these to gain four gold. Not only have you gained control of India so you get the five victory points, but every control marker you have is worth one gold in the in phase four anyway, and now you've made them worth an extra gold by spending East India Company at the opportune moment. So that's what these tiles are on the board. Once somebody takes them, they have them forever. That's the case for most of these tiles. So that's the company tiles. They are, exist in various areas, and they apply to only those areas. The East India Company is special. It can apply to East, to East Indies or to India, your choice when you use it. Levant Company is the same way for these two Ottoman and Mediterranean. So there's a little variability there. But let's talk about these other tiles. God, they're delicious. They're so good. You want them all, right? These green ones are known as uh, improvement tiles, and the improvement tiles are permanent passive bonuses that apply for the rest of the game for you. Logistics, and these, by the way, have a nice text in the backside to help you know what they say, what they do, but the iconography is usually pretty clear once you get an idea, is normally when you move, it costs you, you can move two things. Logistics means whenever you take a move action, you can move three, and that's super, super strong. Adding an extra plus one to a surprise move and attack is can be the difference between winning and losing. Just that simple. Banking means every time you tax, you get three gold instead of two, which ultimately can save you a lot of unrest over the course of the game and allow you to really push your money to the maximum. But you can see logistics cost you a population when you take it, and banking costs you two gold when you take it. So there's a little upfront cost. And because these are useful for the entire game, you want to get these early so they can provide you the benefit for the whole game. If you buy one of these in War 3, it's kind of like I spent an entire action and five gold on naval training. It's going to help me for two battles. That's probably not worth it. So there's a lot of people grabbing up all these tiles early in the game, specifically the improvement uh, tiles. Uh, militia lets you build two units at a time instead of one. Actions are so precious in this game. Being able to get two builds for the price of uh, for for this for one action is great. Still costs you two population, but building two for one means you don't have to spend an entire action building two units and then attack next turn. You can build two units this turn and immediately attack. Right? That's that's very powerful. Um, naval training. If you have more naval training than your opponent you get a plus one in the naval battle. If you have more army training than your opponent, you get a plus one in the army battle. I didn't talk about it, but there is a naval component to combat. If both sides want to commit their naval forces, there's a naval battle that plays out mostly the same as the land battles we just looked at. Only the winner of the naval battle gets a plus one in the following land battle. That's the only thing the naval battle does for you. It also inflicts losses on your opponent and potentially losses on you because of the seven, uh, seven roll rule. Uh, but that's that's the, these uh, army training and navy training very expensive. They cost six. But if you have more of these than your opponent does, you can take multiples. If you take two army training, that's six gold, six uh, twelve gold. That's very lot of gold. But 
very lot. But you uh, you then probably guarantee that you're getting a plus one in every single combat from then on. Maybe you can afford a smaller army that moves around the board. Army training plus logistics. Oh, that's a great combo, isn't it? A lot of these have good combinations. So those are the improvement tiles. Then you've got the free action tiles, all the blue ones. These can be used once per war. Again, means you want to get them in the first war so that you can use, use them three times. Reserves let you re-roll the dice, either the naval or the land combat dice, in order to re, you know, get a new result. If you had, uh, if you were attacking with a plus two advantage and you just happened to roll really crappy and you rolled a seven but the opponent uh, rolled a really good number and so you get two losses. Oh no, that's terrible. You can throw your reserves in and hopefully change the results on the reroll. And if the opponent has reserves, they could also try to do it too. Mercenaries lets you get a free unit as a free action. That's different from militia, which costs two population to get those two units. Instead, mercenaries cost no population, pops onto the board for free almost wherever you, basically wherever you want it, and is a free action. So you could do a build and a mercenaries, send them both to the same area, and then attack where the opponent didn't think that you were going to be strong enough to do so. Free actions are great. Improved agriculture, taking it gives you a population, and then you can use it each turn to gain a population. That can help offset the fact that, you know, you built a lot of guys and you don't have a lot more. That's a problem. You do gain five population, by the way, every phase four, uh, which means you're encouraged to spend down to at least four or five so you don't waste that extra population. But remember that that happens after you make money, so there's always that tension there. I like it. And then you've got diplomatic service. That's a free local alliance, baby, anywhere you want. Press gangs, same as mercenaries, but for ships, you get a free ship. Train native militia. You get to send a, an army directly to one of these colonial areas without rolling the sea die. That's pretty good, too. That's a free action. That's everything. And then War Office is a free attack action. Now, it is expensive. And you're looking at that, and you're going, wow, eight gold. That's the most expensive thing on this entire board. But if you can do a build action with militia that builds two guys that both go to the Mediterranean, then you do a move action with logistics that moves three guys to the Mediterranean, and then you do, that's two actions, then you do your war office attack, you can get five guys that move to an area and attack there. Your opponents will never see it coming. It's an amazing, amazing tool having the war office because it lets you do a third action for free that can be an attack. That's crazy good. So then we got these uh, one-time actions, these immediate action tiles. Government reform is very simple. It simply removes two unrest. So if you got too much built up, you, you, get the, you, get it, you pay it down with this. You spend an action to pay it down. Remember, taking a tile is a special action. Very lot of times you're going to want special actions to do other things. If you have to spend it on government reform, Eh, that's a big opportunity cost. These often disappear towards the end of the game when players are in good positions and they're trying to pay down their unrest so they don't go over 20 or so that they don't have the most at the end since it can cost you so many victory points. Industry costs you two population, gives you two unrest tokens, but then gives you three victory points and an additional victory point for every improved agriculture you have. So industry can be very valuable, more valuable to the people that have agriculture. Don't let one player have all three of these. Uh, we had a player that had two improved agriculture that just took all three industries over the course of three ra of three turns, uh, and everybody turned around and go, wait a minute, he just jumped 15 victory points. Why didn't any of us take industry? Well, it's got a lot of negatives on it. Cost you two population, cost you two extra unrest. Man, that's rough, but 50 15 victory points is a lot. That can easily win you the game. He did, in fact, win that game. Spoiler alert. Um, so then you've got the tactics tiles. These are one of the unique tiles. Everything else here, the the one-time in immediate use tiles, by the way, you use them and they're gone. They get thrown out of the way back into the back into the uh, box. But everything else stays in your area and you keep it forever. The immediate action, I'm sorry, the tactics tiles are one-time use and then they go back for other people to use. So a surprise attack is something you can use when you're making an attack. No players can ally with the defender. They can't help them. So that's very useful if you've got two players that have taken over, for example, uh, you know, control of 
the German states. They're in an alliance and they're both backing each other up. If somebody tries to attack one of them, the other one will, will work and they've got that deal running, right? You get surprise attack and it will let you bust that alliance up. Your allies can still join, the defender's allies can't. It's a very useful thing to help break that siege. And if you use it, it goes back to the pool and somebody else can use it. And it's possible that you have it, use it as part of an attack, and then as your special action, you take it back. That is a very expensive way to do it, but you definitely can do it. Blockade uh, is a cool one. You can put it out in one of the colonial areas to prevent other players from uh, moving there unless they have more ships than you do. Um, and you can also use it to gain a plus two for naval support instead of a plus one. So that's also kind of cool. Fighting withdrawal is very valuable. You can, after any defeat, you can spend it to avoid all losses. So A, it can save you up to two full build actions and up to two unrest tokens. I think this one is undervalued. I think it's a very valuable. You can just take it earlier in the game and then whenever you have a really bad loss, just spend this to avoid losing the guys, right? Or even just one loss that could be critical to a counterattack. You don't want to lose that one fort that you had or the one guy that you had there. It can be very valuable. So that's all these tiles. The last thing that you can do is incite a pirate attack or a colonial revolt. And this is brilliant too, because what if you're on the alliance with the guy who's winning? It's the third war. You want to hurt them. You want to take stuff from them, but you can't because you're in the same alliance. Well, you can pay someone else to do it for you. That someone else is the pirates. So if you're in it, looking at a, uh, any um, of these player-owned control markers in the colonial regions, the pirates can be used to attack them. If I'm blue and I'm on the same side with red, but I don't want red to get the five victory points for the Caribbean, I can incite a pirate attack against them, which is basically going to be the pirate token at a strength of one attacking any naval forces the defender has. Of course, I chose the area where red has no navy, didn't I? And then you would roll the dice and it's a plus one of the pirates. In this case, the pirates still lost because they rolled poorly. But, you know, most of the time the pirates are going to win and the pirates take over that area. The red person loses it. They might even lose units if they had some there to lose. And now you can attack the pirates and take that token. Brilliant. You can also use it with the rebel tokens, which is a land-only attack, and it can only be used in the Americas. So that that is just great, having that extra tool in the toolbox. It's not that much more complicated. I love it. You can tell I love a lot of things about this game. Now, phase four is the upkeep and income phase that I mentioned, income and upkeep. You get money for your population and for your control markers on the board, and then you pay money for each military unit on the board. You pay one gold. And this can wind up with you being in the negative, meaning you have to tax. Or if you did things well, it could wind up with you being in the positive. Also could be because you're behind and you lost all your military units. Uh, but you can wind up in the positive. So that's, that's a pretty cool thing. And then here you get to pay out all the victory points based on exactly as we said, whoever has the majority of control markers. These are friendly shares, so if blue and yellow both have the most, they're tied for the most, they both get eight points. So you can try to wheel and deal. Listen, you and me both get two. Uh, we don't need to, you know, fight over white. We can just sit there and go for something else. We'll both share the eight points and we'll support each other somewhere else and defend and nobody can take German states from us. And white says, I'm okay with that. Here's one gold, so you guys go with that deal, however you want to do it. And then there's the cleanup phase. So that's the game. You do that three times and then you count of victory points at the end and it is incredibly fun. As I mentioned, my favorite things about this include the negotiation elements because there's so many tools you can use to negotiate. You can trade gold, you can trade favors. Those are non-binding favors, by the way. So it's if I'll help you attack this time, if you help me attack in the German states next time, they don't have to do that. They can even say they will and then right at the moment where they have to commit, they can say, no, 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 not going to do it. Um, I prefer to play the rule where if you're doing something where it's a simultaneous exchange, we're like, okay, we're at the commitment phase. I'm handing you two gold. Are you committing? Otherwise you have a, well, hand me the gold first. No, 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 you commit first. No, you hand me the gold first. That's stupid. I just say, listen, if it's a simultaneous exchange, it's a binding agreement. You both just simultaneously agree. But if it's for any kind of future action, promises are non-binding. I, I, th that allows for a lot of different shenanigans that I do love. The variability for this game that I love. I love how it's set up differently each time. And during the, you know, the reset phase, 
when you go back to, not the reset phase, but phase one, where you distribute new neutral region markers, that, boom, adds new things to the board to fight over. You're not just, and often that means that players in the early part of the war are fighting over those neutrals because the neutrals won't fight back that hard. Unless you're in the Ottoman Empire for some reason. They really, really fight back hard. Um, but the neutrals don't fight back hard or maybe you're spending actions to colonize things or use Gold Coast commerce. Um, that really kind of changes after all those easy options get taken over halfway through the war, everybody's fighting each other all of a sudden again. But that kind of phase change and changing things up and, and changing the board really makes it so that the, each individual war, War One is very different from War Two, and War Two is very different from War Three. so it really keeps things fresh. Lots of replayability there. And because the battle board you know, it's it's a it's a perfect information game. You can easily see what everybody has. There's no hidden hand of cards, but it's not that deterministic because there is this luck element with the dice. Now it's less luck, less swingy than if you did the sum of the dice plus bonuses. Some of the dice plus bonuses would be very swingy. Um, if you have, for example, a plus four, that's almost a certainty that you're going to win. And a plus five is really close to guaranteed that you're going to win. It's like 98% or 97%. If you have a plus five net over the opponent, you're basically going to win. And you can manage that a lot of the time by moving guys around and getting your alliances to kick in and paying other people not to kick in their allies. So you can definitely get and finagle plus threes, plus fours, and then the luck is mitigated. There's further ways to mitigate luck by getting a reserve token. There's further ways to mitigate luck by getting fighting withdrawal or surprise attack tokens. But there's still enough luck to create drama. Oh, I did a surprise attack and I had reserves, but both of my rolls were crap. And it's because you won the naval battle that I chose not to use my reserves in that gave you the plus one in the land battle, that blah, blah, blah. They get the luck is often seen as a negative factor by some gamers, but it really creates a narrative, a story, a comeback, a drama, right? If everything happens exactly as you expect it to, that's math, that's calculation, and that's competition too, don't get me wrong, there's skill involved. A lot of people like chess and go for that, right? They like that there's no luck, but it's not, you can't really tell a dramatic story about chess, at least not as easily as you can about these games where you have, oh, so-and-so brought in guys and he got knocked down and then he brought in more guys and he used his reserves and he still lost. Like, those are crazy fun stories. So that I like. There's so many options. As the game goes on, there's less and less options because these uh, tiles are very a finite amount. And so eventually you're going to run out of militia, you're going to run out of banking, especially with seven players. But, I'm um, sorry, I shouldn't say that. The, the number of tiles is um, scaled to the number of players. So in, in my plays, it's felt pretty similar uh, between my five-player game and my four-player game. So um, the number of tiles slowly disappears after the first war. There's very few left, but somebody might snag one early, a couple of them early in the second war. And by the third war, the only ones people are taking are the government reform and the industry if there are any left. So that, again, makes the wars feel different. And it starts with way more options than you can even fathom and slowly goes down to less and less until you're really just at each other's teeth and all your actions are used for fighting and building and fighting. Um, and that, again changes the game. There are a lot of variants in the game. Um, for example, uh, it's partly because this deluxe edition that I've been explaining changes the rules from the base game, and it uh, changes the rules in a lot of ways that I think were good. Uh, if you want to see the explanations for this, I think there's some links on the Kickstarter page for it. Just search for Struggle of Empires Kickstarter. You can go to Struggle of Empires uh, on Board Game Geek, and a few pages back on the forums, there's a couple of journals where the the designer of the Deluxe Edition talks about why he made the different changes that he made. Uh, so those are really fun reading. Uh, and it, the, the rule book provide the game provides the, uh, the ability to go back and play it by the original 2004 rules. But in basically every case, I think it has been made better. The only variance I would recommend is the drafting variant, which is recommended in the rulebook for experienced players if they wish to avoid the randomness of the early setup. Like if somebody's, oh man, I got stuck with Africa, India, and the East Indies just randomly, and those don't have a lot of victory points down there, right? I got screwed. Like some people might feel that way. And 
other people might feel, oh, I got too many tokens in Europe and there's too much fighting over the tokens. I got no, I had no tokens that were just easy to defend. Everybody's fighting over my tokens in the, in the, in the, in, you know, there's, there could be reasons I'm not a strategic master, but you know, there could be reasons that you want to draft things. And the draft variant is very nice. The only other variant I might recommend is the variant that changes the industry token to having a plus one for every agriculture to just being a flat three victory points. The original industry token was a flat three victory points. And the original agriculture token was not plus one when you take it. It was only plus one when you use it and it cost you four gold. But the, the designers of this new edition felt that the improved agriculture to tiles were very rarely taken by competitive players, by experienced players. It just cost too much to get you that plus one. So not only did they remove the cost, they also gave it a plus one population when you take the tile and they made industry give it a plus one victory point. Um, that might be too big of a buff for improved agriculture. And rather than make it cost four again, I think just taking away its bonus victory point may make it work a little bit better. But honestly, the only reason that player got 15 in that game is because we let them. Some anybody else could have taken those other two. There were there were five players in that game that could have taken the other two tokens. Four players that could have taken the other two tokens before it came back around to the Prussian player to take the other two. So I think it's still pretty well balanced overall. And if you really want to weaken the improved agriculture tile, the industry tile is the way that I would do it. So that's the variance that I would recommend. Again, I've only played a four and five player game, but the original was really only designed for a seven player experience, maybe a six player. The redesigned deluxe version um, uses a special, uh, or sorry, takes Martin Wallace's suggestion for playing with fewer players that wasn't in the original 2004 rules and turns it into, maybe it wasn't the original rules, but it basically adds non-player power. So if Spain isn't being played by a player, you basically put five random Spain um, units out around the board. You make them a non-player power. They get auctioned off last and their tokens, their units, their military units always side with their allies. So then you actually do want to fight over the neutral player power. Oh, hey, there's a bunch of Spanish units that happen to be in Europe in areas that I'm going to be fighting over. I want Spain to be on my side. So they give me a plus one in combat. You know, that's that, that having a non-player power or in the case of our flat five player game, we had two non-player powers that we were fighting over. Um, that works out pretty well. Uh, and the thing is, and here's why I didn't like the four player game. In the four player game, it was very, it very quickly and easily settled into a situation where, okay, Spain controls all of India. They've got all the control markers there, but one. And England controls all of the East Indies. They've got all the control markers there, but one. And Russia controls all of Central Europe. They've got all the control markers there, but one. So because there are so few players, it was very easy for people to take control of entire regions uh, because there wasn't as many, there just aren't as many players spread out over the 11 areas. And if somebody controls, like if Green has this situation, well, does anybody really want to go fight a strong green player in India to get three points? No, they might do it for five points, but in order to get five points, you have to take over three of their areas. And that's very expensive to get five points. It's much less expensive to go take a single token in the Ottoman Empire to get those four points, right? So once a player takes control of an entire region, like four or five tokens uh, of, the, of the control markers in an area, it becomes prohibitively expensive to go after the first place marker there because it has become so easy for that to happen with four players. At least that's my experience. So I think five is okay. Five worked out pretty well. Six and seven would be even better. The game is going to sing even better at seven. And that's what everybody says about the original rules. I have no reason to believe that this deluxe edition with the rules changes, which are mostly minor, um, are, are going to be any different. So that's the game. That's my thoughts. This is run way too long. <laughs> I tried to make it as succinct as possible. I hope you guys uh, enjoyed it. And if you're interested, pick this game up. It's great. If you want to play this um, version, you can get the Vassal module on uh, the vassalengine.org. That site is available uh, in the comments or the description here. Um, and 
I believe you can also get this deluxe Kickstarter edition in, at retail right now. Um, so go check it out. I highly recommend it, by the way. The physical version is beautiful. It's gorgeous. It's everything you hope that a Kickstarter would be. Um, and it doesn't have a lot of like the unnecessary extra stuff. Like, you know, it doesn't have minis and stuff that you're paying through the nose for that you really don't need. Um, the wooden army tokens are really nice. They're screen printed with a nice um, symbol. They're what I use as the basis for what these tokens look like. Um, I'm showing some of the pictures on the board. You can see it's gorgeous. It's great. I, I And the box art is, is really nice. Like, it's just a great physical production. And it works great as a physical game, too. It's not one of those games that gets super fiddly in a physical space, as far as I can tell. I mean, I just took it out and I set it up and I looked around and stuff and played around with the stuff. And I don't think it's a fiddly game. So that's my recommendation. Bridger, out. Have a good one, everybody.